some of these topics come up elsewhere. Um, and it's really about making sure you have your ducks in a row before you get streamed, before you go viral, and, um, and you miss out on a lot of things and you make bad decisions um, and don't have all your rights squared away, don't have a good contract in place. Um, and it's a, it's a warning to everybody. Who's an artist in here or an artist manager? There you go. There you go. So practical information, I think, from this panel. So um, let's go from my left to right and introduce yourself. Absolutely. So I'm, I'm a late addition to this panel, that's the third, but uh, my name's Ash Kearney. I'm an entertainment attorney, uh, predominantly, uh, overwhelmingly 90% music, uh, do some film work as well. But uh, I have a, a niche boutique uh, DIY indie artist, midstream artist, uh, heavily focused practice in Philadelphia. Former, uh, and I, prior to that, was the touring working artist for, for, for a decade, which is why I'm here to do this. Uh, my name is Rosa Mano, I'm the CEO of a company called Vidya. Um, we monetize and distribute uh, music and video content uh, across the web, and so we promote uh, you know, just viral videos, help them monetize their content uh, you know, on YouTube, Vivo, Facebook, Instagram, and anywhere else you've ever seen a music video. Hey, my name is Salento. I'm 19. I'm an entertainer. I'm an entrepreneur. And I'm from Atlanta, Georgia. Woo! Yeah! Uh, my name is Daniel. I'm based out of New York, uh, but from West Virginia, so a little close to Georgia. Um, but I'm the head of uh, music licensing and operations for Touch Tunes and Play Network. Uh, we're uh, one of the largest background music companies for bars, restaurants, retail, hotel. You go into a Starbucks, you're listening to music that we license and program. All right. Who here has seen Salento's video? Who's seen it like a hundred times? <laughs> <laughs> yes, you want to see it the dance levels. Maybe, maybe a little at the end. Maybe, maybe a little at the end. Okay. okay. Um, it seems like you're a veteran already. You're 19. Yes. How long have you been out of high school? Um, about like a couple months now, like eight months. <laughs> oh, sure. Eight months. I've been like, you know, practicing, you know, trying to get things together for my new album release before it goes viral. You know, I don't want to make the wrong mistakes if I do it at 16. I'm a little more educated now, and I'm focused. So tell me about um, when the video came out and uh, and the contract that that you had originally. Well, um, I dropped the song on SoundCloud. It went viral overnight. And I sat in school and read emails from different labels asking they want to sign me, fly to my house and talk with me. So I started showing the producer and he reached out to them and then they came and I signed to Capitol Records. It was a single option. How long did that take? Um, so they signed with Capitol? Well, they was trying to rush it. But it still took about six months. So we finally did the deal. We put the song out. And I was traveling doing my promo run. And I was getting ready. They wanted me to get out of school. But I didn't want to leave my school because I wanted to show all my classmates that you could be successful at a young age. Because if I would have left, then they wouldn't have had nothing to look at anymore. And I felt like. If I would have left, I wouldn't have been grounded with the people that I came up with, the people that supported me, and stuff like that. So I stayed in school to get my high school diploma, just so I could drop my album, and it can be titled Fresh Out of High School, to let all the young people you know all around the world that you can be successful at a young age, and still come back right after you get out, no matter what. Woo! Yeah! It went viral about 11th grade, but I had other stuff I was doing in school. I was, I got a thousand likes on all my pictures on Facebook since I was like 14 years old. I've always been on social media. I've always been marketing myself to make people like me. I've learned how to charm people and just make things people create like they really like. And I've been in Future Business Leaders of America since I was 14 years old. So I, I'm real, real, real intimate about business. And I know that it's not all about fame, it's about numbers. 
<laughs> Anybody want to guess how many views, how many views the Watch Me video has? 1.5 billion? You looked it up? I did. <laughs> <laughs> he knew right away. 1.5. 1.5. Um, you know, that not only that, there's a lot of user-generated videos, too, because everybody made a video for that, right? Yeah. I looked some up. There's one with Alvin and the Chipmunks that have 58 million. Um, there's a Kids Pop that has 7 million. That seems low. There's one with Elmo that has a million. <laughs> Somebody made one with two characters from the movie Frozen. That has five million. And I'm, I'm missing the minions, thousands. The emojis, um, the smirks. Um, we sent a lot of new movies. Um, I even created a commercial for Nickelodeon for their TV shows. For Labor Day. It's like new episodes on Labor Day. So that I can play it every Labor Day weekend. The whole week they just air it every morning. And I used to be in school and everybody come to school and say, Hey, I just saw you on TV again. I'm tired of seeing you. <laughs> My sister keep watching you before I come to school and stuff, so So tell me about the production deal that you had. Um, um I mean you were young. You didn't have a lawyer? Well, I did. I did have a lawyer, but I was 17, and the Guardians at the time I had wasn't really focused on me being a superstar. It was focused on me graduating. That was the whole focus. But I was looking past graduating. I'm not gonna wait to 18 and try to go to college and sit down in a class for so long trying to figure out what I want to do when I can just sit in the room after school and just think. For all those hours I had it myself and create something that I don't have to work so hard on. And I can elaborate from that and go to another obstacle or platform if I want to. And not just for me, I can help somebody else. Yep. <laughs> did you stay in school the whole time? Did, did you take some time off? I did stay in school. I mean, I love to go get chicken wings and french fries, you know, when I got my truck or whatever. But as far as that, I never, I, I like being in school. Like, I love to be in class. Cause they just be like, why are you in class? It's just the fact that I get to be in class and still be me and still be a world superstar. Mm -hmm. I don't think nobody's ever had that feeling to just sit there. And I wanted to be the first person to sit and say, I stayed in school. So what would you do differently if you needed to sign that deal now knowing what you know? Because it was not a favorable deal for you. Well, at the end of the day, it was favorable because the deal was done when I was underage. Sure. So at the end of the day, it was always in favor because I started young. Yeah. And you will always learn from your mistakes. I knew that I was going to go through a couple of things, a lot of things, before it got to the point where I really could have my situation in my hand where I could control it. Because that's how it goes, right? So. I was just being humble and just paying attention and just learning, remembering everybody I met, remembering all my relationships, just remember all my steps, everything they made me do. I just remember everything. I studied it, I just paid attention to my lifestyle. And I just never forgot it because at the end of the day, I'm not with none of those people now and I still remember all that stuff and I'm with a whole new team now. That's great. Ash, you, you talked to a lot of people early on and what do you tell them just whether or not you get a viral hit? Right, yeah, yeah. You need to have your ducks in a row? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, obviously I come at things from the legal, the legal side of things, so I want to make sure that people are protected. Um, and so probably the, the biggest thing is, 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 is the co-writes and securing the splits. Uh, if, if you are co-writing, um, getting clearances ahead of time because a lot of times, especially in the pop and rock, in the pop and hip hop world where you're incorporating other people's creative works, like these young kids, they don't know anything. They're just ripping shit off of SoundCloud or they're doing on YouTube or whatever and throwing it on the beat. And then they're getting their, they're getting their friends to rap over it or whatever. You know, it's all love. There's nothing there's nothing to worry about until there's something to worry about. So when I what I try to impress upon my uh, clients is that, you know, th these are, these are landmines, potentially, they could be. Uh, 
if it does pop, because when there's no money involved and there's no success or there's no fame or none of that shit ahead of time, nobody cares. But the minute, and I'm sure you, you know, you can tell you, the minute that it hits, all of a sudden the daggers come out of the woodwork for this stuff. And if, if somebody has a vested interest or they claim to have a vested interest, but you don't have documented evidences that they don't have an interest or do have an interest, um, you know, there's a potential to be sued there. So I think it's just about like um, getting your business right, like getting your things together. So. You know, the, the, the other thing is is, is really uh, when, when people are working, like like you had talked about a little bit, that you had went in the studio and they kind of just gave you free recording time, right? Is this enough? Yes, I used to um, leave my seventh period class. I leave school early because I really, I was lied to about having a college run. So I really wanted to be something before I got out. And it was like my whole goal. So. Yeah, they recorded me for free and just show interest in me. So, and that's good. That's a great thing, right? Like you, you think that's a good thing, but what's what's dangerous in that? Karen, I literally just spent like the past two months working through a situation between uh, a studio, a producer going to the studio, and an artist about control of the masters. Um, and the, the, the the songwriting was was fine, but basically he had fronted. She she had paid a, a minimal amount of money. Uh, certainly not to compensate the full amount of time or whatever. And she thought she owned the masters. And uh, and in terms of the producer, the, no, the artist thought she right. owned the, the our masters. Okay. When in fact the producer uh, made a claim on the masters, and he threw up DMC take, DMC takedown notices when she went to put it on Spotify. And my mind was a whole it was a whole mess. You see um, that all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So because so somebody's gonna block rights. It's, it's, it's like blocking rights. Um, so. Shut up after this, but the point being is that multiply that times a billion views or you know, whatever, something overnight, like this was a pretty easy situation to rectify because there wasn't a lot of money involved yet. Um, but the point about being prepared is you don't ever want to get in that situation where you get a hit and then all of a sudden somebody's throwing up you know copyright claims and, and all this stuff and it just becomes litigious. So that that's really the big one. When's the best time to do all that? Yeah. Talk about splits. <laughs> yeah. 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 Early in the studio? Yeah. <laughs> good, good to go over there? Yeah. yeah, I mean, one time I was in the studio, I didn't know about splits at first, but once I started learning it. Did you have splits on, uh, on Flashman? No, I didn't. And you didn't? Before I went by, I didn't have them? No, I was underage. I didn't know anything about yeah. splits, but my song was on iTunes. My song was on a whole lot of platforms, and I didn't even know it. And you, and you had to settle it afterwards, right? Once it was big? Yes, actually still selling it now. <laughs> so, so, <laughs> I'm sure it's pretty obvious to most people, but they don't you know about basically just figuring out ownership, ownership of it, calculating who owns what percentage. Um, so you, you were saying earlier that they had taken a pretty big percentage or whatever have you, but that's what we're saying. Get that out of the way ahead of time so you know. Well, you know, it's funny that on, on a video front, I see something similar to that. So it's like where like someone will come in and be like, I'm an artist, and then someone else will be like, oh, I have a camera. You know, let's, yeah. let's shoot a video, right? Well, guess what? If they're shooting a video and then it's it's free, or even if you give them money, by the way, like you know, all of a sudden the video blows up, and then someone comes along and says, "Well, I own I own all those visuals," and they're like, "What are you talking? About? I, I paid you for those visuals." And they're like, "No, no it, yeah, you compensated me for my time, yeah, time. but there's no work for hire agreement, so there's no ownership. So I own, you know, so there's so there's a master, um, you know, so there's master side on the actual, uh, you know." I see Carlos looking at me right there and be like, yeah, I get that agreement for that video. Um, but, yeah, but, you know, it's, it, it's, it's, you know, there's a master on the audio, there's a master on the video. I mean, any time someone contributes any, you know, I mean, as per copyright, I'm not a lawyer, but- No, it's true, copyright, it's a joint work. Yeah, it's, 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 it's a joint work. It, yeah. Is that common to do that? Just exchange cash without a contract? With oh, yeah, yeah, that, that, that is like, I would say that's like, that is 90% of the use majority. cases, the vast majority of the time that there's not a work for hire agreement. And, and you can just Google these, you know, documents. It's just a, it's a simple one pager that just says, you know, what you're doing, you're being compensated and you release any like intellectual property, you know, uh, claims, uh, you know, to the body of work. Ash, that'll suffice if you get something online and well, I did. I mean, if you're gonna, if you're gonna, but, you know, but legal's gonna be yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So, so, so the plug for the lawyer is like, be careful of the documents that you pull off the line. Because, yeah, you're going to work. Yeah, yeah, for sure. But I mean, look, I do think at a minimum, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to do a support sheet. You can get them anywhere. Basically, it's like who owns what. But Roy's right. Like, anytime you have a joint word, um, copyright in order for there to be assignment by law it has to be in writing. 
Um, so the fact that you pay somebody cash and you think there's an oral or an implied contract may or may not stand up in court. So, so the, the point being is early, early as you can. I do understand the creative side of it where you don't want to compromise the creativity in the studio where like you start talking numbers and like, people, it, you know, so that can get a little touch and go. But you know, I would say as soon after the session as possible, you know, you kind of just have that conversation where you're like, hey, I think you know this is what it might be, and it, it, it's an art. It's not a science. There's no, it's, it's personality driven. But the takeaway being, earlier is better. Get it in writing, and you know, and, and, and you don't have to. Yes, get to a lawyer as soon as possible, but but you can use plain English and just this is what it is. Like, I think I think the biggest thing, and, and you know, from having worked with a lot of artists, is that they say, okay, well, not only you know, early on, your music career is costing you money. I don't know if it's are you not making money, but it's costing you money. Then the idea of like saying, okay, well, you know, between the you know, however many writers and the videographers and all the other stuff, like you know, you know, they're, they're looking at legal bills of even if it's a couple thousand dollars, that's, that's a lot of money. So, so they say, okay, well, you know, we'll figure it out later. And just like you know, I mean, like you said, like once it becomes. A bigger issue, then all of a sudden, like you know, the bigger, you know, the more money there is, the, the bigger the problem becomes. So then everything kind of falls apart, which 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 destroys, you know, I mean, everything. At the end, you know, virality is always about momentum, and, and when we kill, like you said, I've seen things where they they're completely going viral. Someone in the studio feels like they're getting left out, right? They, they always do that thing where it's like you start seeing, like who, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. and everyone, you know, people start getting their own counsel, their own whatever. And then, uh, and then someone will put like a block or a take down, and that takes nothing. You can just contact YouTube and do a block notice, and they'll take your word for it. And then all of a sudden, the, the video, the songs will just be taken down. They'll say, "Okay, uh, until we figure this out." They have a legal obligation to take it down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not black and white. It's, I mean, it's black and white. So, so yeah, ask if there's still dispute over splits or ownership. A party can issue a take down notice. Yeah, I mean, yes, even if they're wrong. I mean, ultimately, you can recover in tort if 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 they if it was um, out of malice, like if they, they knowingly did it, like they fucked with you and no. they had no no legal basis for that. But that's after the fact. But the point is that you kill the momentum and it's yeah. like you're done. Yeah, but, but, but nine out of the ten are broke artists. We're gonna get like yeah, right, right. And that's the economics of it. Don't even make sense. But what it, what we're just saying is is that like you're right. It does not take anything. Every under law, there's a provision 512 that basically it's a safe harbor. Every DSP um, has to have this for them to not be, um, have vicarious copyright infringement. Sorry, I don't want to go too wonky on something. But basically YouTube, by law, has to have an agent and a method in which somebody can just send an email that says, you know, this is my video, I have rights in this, and they're, they, don't, they don't legally have the right to put this up there. Um, and even if they're wrong, YouTube has to bring it down. And then there's a there's a response and you know, there's a whole process in which this other party can retort and everything like that. But to the point, but, but, but practically speaking, what the effect is is that it kills the momentum at least for a, a couple of weeks. It could be you know, and then at that point, that's that's a lot of time in that. In that yeah, like a five percent copyright holder on a composition could run an entire video and complete the yeah, rights because they need they need to see the birds rights. Yeah. That was your experience. Yeah, they took Wash Me Down the first day. First day for for two hours. I texted A and I was like, my video down. What's going on? He was like, Oh, for real? Hold on, let me call YouTube. And they put it back like two hours later. <laughs> Somebody flagged it. They flagged it. Disliked it. Twenty people claimed it. It was crazy. Well, also, uh, there's also um, uh, like a lawsuit for like three years to try to get a claim off of it. There it is. And, uh, so it says lawsuit for three years so trying to get a claim. The money was still generated. And on the third chapter, every, like you said, it, 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 it didn't make sense. And everything got to where people were sued and looking at the bud. Then all those court things got held up and came back. But it, you know, people, people generally throw out claims. We have, we have one right now. We even sit down now. I was like, let's go in with it right now. <laughs> Daniel. You spent some time looking for the owner when Watch Me blew up. That's right. And what what'd you do? What happened? Well, I think from your somewhat fruitless search, um, it eventually paid off. Uh, not to be too dire, but um, so one thing that I value is registration, having your information registered, and 
as many systems as possible. So at least in the US, you've got Harry Fox, MRI, ASCAP, BMI, CSAC, uh, up in Canada, you have SOCAN and uh, CSI or similar so track. But if you are registering your publishing in any of these systems, what that means is you're going to be more likely to be found when these other commercial services are trying to license your music. So we get requests daily for SoundCloud music, basically music that's maybe not yet available on Spotify and Apple, but it is popular and generating enough commercial interest that our, our you know, consumers want to listen to it. And if we can't find the artist, if we can't find the composition, uh, stakeholders, the songwriters and producers, then we can't put the music up. So we spend a lot of time running around, not just uh, you know, on, on these uh, services, but also we're on Facebook, we're on Twitter, we're blasting you know, artists themselves on their personal accounts, trying to contact who their legal or business management is, who can help us get an agreement in place. Under a normal situation, where do you get your content? Are you ingesting from labels or distributors? That's correct. So, okay. and, and metadata comes with that, so normally you would have well, the information you need? As a, as a, a major label alumnus, um, I'd say some metadata comes from it. Okay. Uh, labels themselves don't provide very much uh, music publishing and composition info. It depends on company to company, but I think with uh, Salento being signed to Capital, we, we receive the master recording eventually. Okay. Um, when other tracks have you know, been hitting that same viral popularity, we sometimes are waiting weeks to get the actual sound recording um, delivered to us through the traditional channels. What about non-traditional channels? I mean, if somebody's independent and you track down this independent artist, you're not receiving this from a label like you normally would. Yeah, in that case, then we would uh, obviously break with tradition um, and we'd be able to ingest the music uh, manually. Um, but the likelihood is it wouldn't have maybe the standard ISRCs, which are really critical to accounting um, and making sure that we're tracking the plays correctly. Um, but it's, it's a completely, you know, another side of our business is working with artists to help that label. Um, as much as we encourage people to go to CD Baby or Tempor or AWOL, there is still a path to do it yourself. You just sometimes um, have to do it like for all 40 or 50 services that exist in the US. So it's just a little extra work than maybe just calling up one of those other um, entity guidelines. Yeah. How many recordings in your collection? Uh, we're collection, what, whatever. Catalog. Yeah. Catalog. Okay. Yeah. Uh, our services uh, between TouchTunes and Play Network, we have about 30 million. Um, and that's de duping as many uh, unique recordings as possible. So I know a lot of the commercial services speak to 40, 50 million yeah. um, in their library. Uh, but we have about uh, 30 that we de duping. Okay. How many are video? Can you say? Uh, and you have the audio. Yeah, we have so we're not a video, video service. Um, we, we actually sub license some of our videos okay. from a third party, but um, I couldn't speak to that. Okay. But at least on the audio front, um, we have a, a pretty strong mixture of um, you know, US content, but also things from, from Russia, India, uh, Asia Pacific countries. Mm -hmm. um, and those stacked up together is a lot of data that you have to make sure it's clean so that you can get the rights properly attributed and the payments properly paid out. When something's going viral and there's a big delay in you getting it, how much do you feel like you're missing out? It's significant, I think. Is there just a question on, well, how long is this gonna last? I need this right now. Yeah, I, I'd say that we're oftentimes looking um, at, you know, on a daily basis, uh, we're usually counting how much revenue <coughs> we're losing by not having this content. So, so missing one song that's a viral hit uh, can really knock us down in our uh, projections. Mm -hmm. Roy, how often do you, do you see problems like this where something blows up in a small blow up way or a huge blow up way and the rights are not taken care of? 
ahead of time. It's all once a month. To the, yeah. to the point where it's a real problem. Yeah, no, yeah. I mean, it, 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 to a certain degree, it's all once a month. I mean, that's why we, again, we've been talking about this. Is like, is that, you know, I mean, there's even if the two writers are on board with each other and everyone, everything's cool, like, you know, you never know which one is, is, is actually representing the master because mm -hmm. you have an obligation to represent the master. You know, to uh, account back to the other, you know, rights holders. So you know, so who's gonna? It, so if you could find, you know, uh, touch tunes and go through the services and go through the hoops and figure out everything, like you know, you still um, have to have some sort of like agreement between them, saying, you know, well, which if, if it's us doing a studio, like, you know, who's actually controlling this master? You know, um, and then I see that all the time. Where like, uh, I, I mean, I see producers who put up who put up tracks uh, that go viral. And the artist is just like, wait, what? You know, like, what are you, what are you doing? And then all of a sudden, now what happens is that like the the, the song or the video gets like fifty. I, I've seen it happen with directors. I've seen it happen with producers. Where like the producer or the director will put up the song or the video, that will start getting the hits. They'll be like, what? I didn't even know that they put it up there. They don't want to take it down because they don't want to lose the momentum. They don't want to lose the view count. You know, the view count is like this intangible like you know asset that like I mean its own kind of currency having like you know. A ton of views on it, so you don't want to re upload it, and then you have to, you know, come from a position of weakness to figure out like who owns what and who could enter into these agreements, you know. And that unraveling that, you know, because at the same time, like, you know, when that person starts getting that streaming revenue and they, you know, they go from broke to, you know, all of a sudden seeing forty, fifty thousand dollars a month come in, you know, they, they don't go, oh, you know, this, this guy going to the 401k, they go, uh, you know, they start buying watches and cars and, you know, so then unraveling that stuff is like, right? I mean, it's, it's like a nightmare because it, you know, it's, 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 you know, because very few people could like, you know, I mean, you know, take in all this money and be like, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to do the right thing and make sure everyone, you know, like they just, you know, they, they do whatever the hell they want, you know? And then you figure out who your friends are. <laughs> just, I wanted to just tack on one really great point that we brought up is that uh, financial interest is, is one thing, but control is a whole other issue that's really, really important because you, that can also affect the value of what you have going on. In that, what I'm getting at is if, if, if you do have multiple contributors, uh, joint authors, or whatever, uh, under, under the law, absent a, 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 an agreement to the contrary, they, they both have rights to 100% of that particular uh, uh, song. So you, what, you, what you can see is that you can actually under undervalue or there can, be, there can end up being a, I don't wanna say a bidding war, but whether it's intentionally or unintentionally, like a 5% holder might try to go out and offer out a, uh, you know, like a sync, sync opportunity that is that completely undervalues what, it, what the song actually could get over here. So maybe that person who's, sync, who's looking for the sync, maybe the newbie producer, hits up both of them and they get two different prices, you know, or whatever it might be. And then all of a sudden, you know, this guy had a $10,000 sink, but this one, you know, this person gave it away for 2,000 contractually. Okay, forget like the whole pissing match between these two. Now you've got a third party who's relied on the contract from one of the co-writers. They, so now, you know, they're gonna, they're gonna want their song to use it um, regardless of what happens between those two. So that's the other issue, the other important thing about getting the agreements in place is the splits are really important, they're probably the most important in, in terms of that, but control is also uh, <clears throat> something that is really important, and that's generally you know, by a lawyer. I wouldn't, it, it, can, it can get a little mm -hmm. dicey if, if people do it, but if you can get somebody to be like, okay, I'm going to administer this song for us, that's helpful, because then the people that are looking for the opportunities in the songs, there's one point of contact where they can go, you know, it makes their life easier, you're talking actually, publishing that then? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And order the master. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, but just the idea that there's, you're not giving a message uh, financially or otherwise. Mm -hmm. yeah, just, yeah. Control. I, I think the theme of this whole thing is, is a good independent lawyer from day one is like invaluable. It's, it's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Ash, I was just going to ask, where do you get your clients? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so listen, man, I, it, I'm, I'm in the club still. I'm still out there <laughs> fighting a good fight and, and, and checking out raw talent. Um, but but like anything, like when you get going long enough, it all you know it's it's word of mouth and it's recommendations for other clients. So it comes in from everywhere. Um, you know, my work as an artist for years helps out a lot too because I think people, um, you know, they, they 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 trust me as a person to come learn me that. You know, we're talking about how you got into it. Yeah, yeah, it's an interesting thing. Just briefly, um, it's it's anecdotal and it's great for this one, but. So I was a, I was I was in your guys' seat not too not too too long ago. Um, 
to working, starting hard as a DIY guy for like 10 years. Was really pushing hard, started to get some momentum. Um, we went in the studio, or we, we found what we thought was a pretty good producer. I was naive, I didn't have a lot of liquid cash. Um, and the producer put a, a, a contract in front of me. He, he told me a lot of what he was gonna do. He, he certainly sounded like it was, it was a good game. Um, and ultimately, I paid him $15,000 to do, which he ultimately delivered me an incomplete album, never, never uh, contractually, what he told me was, I later, oh, I'm sorry, the, the point of that was, I couldn't afford, I didn't think I could afford a lawyer at the time. So I trusted him, I, I went on his word, and, and I thought the commitments that he made to me orally were in there, and I was like, okay, we got, we got a good thing going on, and I didn't realize it was a charlatan. And uh, long story short, I had basically paid $50,000 for a half an album that I, you know, and it destroyed me artistically and emotionally um, to the point where I gave up, uh, or I, I did for a long time. And, but I guess the, the code to that whole thing is it pissed me off so much <laughs> that I was like, yo, I'm never letting this shit happen to another fucking artist again. I'm gonna go back to school, be a lawyer, and advocate on behalf of DIY artists. So, that yeah. Yeah. So that, that, that's the end of the story. But, but you know, again, like any of this stuff could really go, like you work your whole life, whether, whether you're 16 or, or, or you're 60 or whatever it is, you're working, you're pushing hard your whole life and you finally get something and finally, finally goes and then something like this happens. It just comes in and cuts, cuts it out from underneath you and emotionally that can take a huge toll on you, you know? So, so this is really important stuff to get your shit right from the top and from the gate. So, you know, you can avoid these business, emotional, artistic pitfalls, you know what I mean? Um, I want to know what makes a, a video viral. I mean, is there any common denominator? I mean, what is it? Well, Dan, you've seen a lot of these too, so I want to hear from you after. It all depends. I thought about the idea of making a dance routine everybody would do. But I practiced it at school every day with girls, boys, nerds. Popular kids, <laughs> teachers, cool teachers, uncool teachers. I would do different things in front of them just to see how they react to it. It's all about a reaction. I just paid attention in class. And when I was in eighth grade, I got nominated class clown. So that's how I knew I was the entertainment. So I just went from there and every day I was sing, rap, dance, just do all, just do crazy stuff. Like, because I never knew what people liked. So I was just trying to figure it out. So I just tried different stuff. And I didn't do no cursing. I didn't do nothing negative. I just being positive, being me, and just basically expressing myself on the beat. Like, watch me, do me. And I did find it a little different from other people's videos and how they go viral and use guns and drugs and fighting and curse words. But you really don't have to use that. Because I mean, at the time my song blew, I was kind of comparing my songs to songs that had cursing and stuff like that. But it, it's, it's all about your quality and your material because you can go to any country in the world and they can play Watch Me With and they know Salento. But in certain countries, you can't play a song with swearing in it. Like, you can go in a restaurant. Sometimes they don't even play hip hop. But if your material is at a quality of like A plus or on a level where everybody can relate to it, then it could be anywhere. That was the video, people could relate to it. Right? Yeah, I put all the videos, like I wanted to put all the different races all around the world in one video dancing together because I never saw it on YouTube before. You also did it in different languages, right? Yes, I, um, I never remix Watch Me in America. I always do it outside of America with artists who speak different languages because I want to get out of America. I don't, I'm trying to, you know, be like Michael Jackson. That's my idol. So, yeah. How many languages? Um, We did Portuguese, French, um, I think it's in one more. Spanish too. Is that that was before the label or? 
Um, it was no after them. I, I pitched I, I pitched a lot of ideas to them for my song because I I just look at things different. I just look at it like it's not me. I don't speak English. I don't know who Silento is. I'm just this person. I don't know him, and I just create things that make you want to know me, that make you want, that make you curious, that make you question. Talenta, correct me if I'm wrong, but did I kind of see a video of Michelle Obama doing some glitch? Yeah, you did. Actually, I met. You did. I met Miss Ocean, Miss Michelle, at the White House. She showed me a video of her nephew. She said, "I sent him a shout out. I always send kids shout outs. I don't make people pay for them because it's not about that." So I sent a shout out. I didn't know it was my nephew. I just always do that. And she she said he sent me this video every day because he knew he was coming. We already know who you are. I just want to say thank you for making him so happy. So and she shook my hand and I took a picture with him. How many countries? I mean, this. Spanish, you cover a lot of countries. Well, before Spanish, Portuguese, before Portuguese, before any of that, I charted in over 200 countries. But okay. So you don't even need to know English. No, no. I taught them English. I go to a lot of countries. They, for some reason, I don't know how, I bring myself to a level where I can adapt myself to their circumstances, to their understanding. Even if they can't understand English, I try to teach them. I teach my fans. Their parents, everywhere I go, I teach them English and they teach me their language. Because I mean, they're my fans and I mean, I'm a fan because they're a fan of me. So I'm a fan of them too. Cool. And I, I would like to talk, like speak with them, like not just sing and be their entertainer, like I'm a role model to kids and I, I like speaking to them and like asking them questions and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Daniel, what is it that you, you've seen the video a few times? You've seen other viral videos and what's the connection? Um, I think one thing uh, that you, you said a minute ago is the relatability. If something is universally um, shared, it's gonna be viral. So there's oftentimes examples where artists may try a little too hard to go viral and it's not genuine. But if something is uh, authentic and it universally speaks to, I think, everything from uh, the music to the performance in the video, whether it's dancing or uh, anything else, it, it's much more likely going to hit. Um, from a from a measured perspective, looking at metrics, a viral video is definitely going to be something that is not necessarily led by commercial success, but through user-generated platforms like a YouTube, Facebook, a SoundCloud that people are gravitated towards, regardless of the label marketing budget, is going to get attention, and every person with the ability to listen to it is gonna be attracted, and they're gonna share it with their friends. That's viral for me. Yeah. You must, Ash, you must um, talk to some artists, and they're going over their plan, and they say, and I wanna make a viral video. <laughs> and you say, some people tell when I saw it, right? I mean, Look, I mean, that's, you, it's organic. You can't, you can't plan for this stuff. Like, I mean, I, that would, that's what I would say. Is like, look, I mean, please, please, please feel free to. Feel you free. can plan it because I've had some viral videos. People don't know it's me, but I've been dancing with with females to different songs. Like Future, I went viral dancing with an artist named Mini Coops to Dave's Loaf and Future song Hey There. I planned it out. I knew that. I just tried it. This is what I did. I sat, I was sitting, I was thinking, because with the video, watch me whip, everybody do watch me whip because when you hear it, it's more like you talking to yourself. It's somebody commanding you to do something like watch me whip. Then if you sing it out your mouth, it's you now. It's your song now. If you make something versatile, commanding, but still in control, people will relate to it. Because a lot of people want control, but we can't get it. But in certain songs, you get control. Or you feel control, so you relate to it and you adapt to it. No, I would, I, I'm with that, and I wouldn't disagree with that at all. Because what, what I think you're doing is being smart and strategizing, and being yourself, right? And that, but that would be what I would tell my artists, which is like, look, if you if you want to increase the odds that this is going to hit, then then make it interesting and original. Like, you're, you're obviously, 
you don't want to be a vanilla hard copy of something that's been done a hundred times. I mean, that's really sort of unique about your thing. I, I guess what my <coughs> proposition is is that we can certainly attempt and try um, and, and 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 distinguish ourselves you know, from, from a harness, I say. But but I, I don't I don't know that virality is, is something that you could purposefully do. I mean, we all try. I mean, there's cottage industries that try to do this shit. Well, some, extra some, some, some people can purpose. Do it a little better than others. <laughs> 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 you know, there are like you can't teach everyone to do it. Yeah. I, I think one of the things that he did that was you know really telling, and I've seen you know from my end, you know running a video platform, is that it wasn't um, zero to hundred. It was like you, you basically test marketed it in your school, right? And so you kind of saw, and, you, and this is what I tell people all the time. It's like you know. Like look at the five thousand views and ten thousand views that you have, and look at like what are the engagements are people into that, and if they're into it, then you should be promoting it or doing it more, and kind of honing in on like what's resonating with your audience. And I think you just basically, you know, had a, an assumption and then test marketed with you know with, with all different because I mean really popular music uh, transcends you know cultures and race, and like you said, it was it was it wasn't a U.S. you know. I mean, you're talking about Gangnam Style, I and mean, it's, it's up there on, on like a worldwide you know phenomenon, and, and so you were you know instinctually um, you know going out there and like trying to present it to, to different people of like different walks of life and different cultural backgrounds, and and you know um, and, and and seeing like their reaction, and then you're like, oh, you know, I I, I, mean, I don't know. I'm guessing you're like, I got something, you know, I got something. Let me, you know, now I'm gonna do it, and I'm gonna put every last bit of effort. And energy into like making sure that everyone can see this, and I think that I, I do think that 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 is a little bit of like it's you know it is deliberate, but it's really having a pulse on on what is resonating with people and doing it at a small scale and, and then elevating it to that high level. Yeah, well said. Good. Um, do you want to take questions? I was just wondering if yeah. the promotion was involved. Like, did you have a budget to like do all this Facebook ads and marketing and all that stuff, or was it like you know they came? Okay, I I have none of that. I I, I was. See, I had a Facebook, but I was already famous on Facebook since I was 13. So I already had a following on my Facebook. <laughs> so, <laughs> it, yeah, so, so what I, I did was, it got to the point that, where. Went, uh, from 13 was it well, dancing? I got dimples. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I wasn't a pushover in school, and I was small. So I got into a lot of altercations. A lot of females love me, and you know, like. <laughs> I didn't have the way I was born, but you know, thank you, God. Thank you. You know what I'm saying? But look, my, I remember sitting in a green room. I said, I said to him, I said, I said, you know, get a viral video, and you probably had no idea that was going to go viral. I was like, no, no, no. I knew from the beginning it was going to go viral. Yeah. I had a dream three times. <laughs> three times. First, it was my talent show. I didn't win the talent show, but I was the only artist who came with my music recorded and my performance and my whole outfit, and they picked my friend. They signed my friend, gave him an advance. He blew his money, and now he's in the predicament where he's trying to figure out his next move. But I'm still his friend. He came back and said, okay, I'm sorry I wasn't, I turned my back. You know what I'm saying? Because I knew that I was gonna make it. I told him before I even did the talent show, I had watched me whip in the bag. I had that song for six months, and I had more music. But I already had another hit too. It was hitting 60,000 plays. I was in the group, I had my own group. And I just used to try different things. I, I just was marketing on every end. The streets, in the school, in the classroom. It's just a lot. A whole lot. Yeah, um, anybody else have any questions? Feel free to jump in anytime. Not a lot of hands up. Okay, well, yeah. I got a question for you. Um, and this comes back to like the whole recording thing. Did you know, like, did you copyright your song before you? No, I didn't. Did everybody I, hear the question? Uh, yeah. Did, did he copyright the song before it was recorded? No, I did not copyright my song. But I did have a video with me singing it a cappella on Instagram and on Facebook. That's how I started. I was singing a cappella dancing in the neighborhood. I got a friend to record me, and I put it on Instagram, and I got 100 comments from girls with her eyes saying, I like the way that you are singing this. So what I did was, I kept singing that tone every day in school. I was very popular. Everybody always watched me, so I was gonna name the song Watch Me. I was in the cafeteria. I told the baseball team, the basketball team, I used to be a basketball manager, 
I used to be a softball manager. I used to play basketball. I used to play soccer. So I had a relationship with almost the whole I, the whole school, and I won Mr. Ninth Grade. I'm very, very popular. So it was like I knew that they was gonna do it because I already had them for so long since middle school. Since I've been in picture business in America, I just learned how to be different because I think that even though sometimes you know you might you might be a problem child or whatever, but at the end of the day, while I was going through my problems, I still was trying to be smart so I could be here today and learn a little bit more, and talk on the panel and tell all the youth about it. But it's more so of you creating the lane you want to be in because right now I've seen a lot of dance artists try to try to make dance songs to top mine but they're not staying on the topic of dancing. They're going into spending money and fighting and then they'll talk about a girl and disrespect the girl in the verse. How do you want somebody to dance to a song and you're disrespecting the girl and then you talk about spending money and then you're talking about smoking? I just, I don't get it. Cause you, you lose the momentum when you talk about something else. So that's why, you got a question? Yeah, yeah. Um, so I'm starting to work with uh, an artist producer and artist Mountain Level uh, in Atlanta. I got a, a song that it's kind of in the, in the vein of, of what you have done and it's getting it's reacting. Um, and I'm starting to uh, kind of do some outreach with uh, uh, arenas and stadiums and sports teams and trying to you know jumbotron kind of perfect fit in that in that standpoint. And I'm, I'm curious if, if you had um, how how did like third party partners like that play into the reality of what you did where you uh, work with kind of existing networks uh, to help kind of advance the, the, uh, the trend? Well, one company I knew that really helped me, it wasn't the label. The label actually came in and x them out. And I wish they didn't do that. But if I knew, I would have, you know, but I didn't know. So I work with Dance On Network. Dance On Network has a lot of dancers worldwide on YouTube. If you look on YouTube, there are certain dancers that always get 100 million views, 50 million views, 20 million views, and every time these dancers dance, they will always get these views. So there are sets of companies and different people you can work with, third parties, to help you out. Um, one of them was Dance On Network. That's the main one I know, was Dance On Network, and they generated over a billion views. Outside of my music video, they generated over a billion views for me as well. So that's one of them. But sometimes, you know, if you might want to pay them to dance, or you might want to make a joint venture with them. If I would have knew that the, I didn't know exactly what the deal was, because I didn't set it up the first time. I just know my song had 10 million hits before any video. Then, when it was time for it to be tracked and coded, it had to be with the company, and I went with TuneCore. And TuneCore reached out to Dance On like that, with their third partners or whatever. And from there, Capital came, and TuneCore was gone, and Dance On was gone, and it more, it more so seemed like the song was going like this for a second because they took away what was what it was about. It was about dancing. It was never supposed to stop. So they left me in the bind like, what's next? What I'm gonna do now? So what I did was I created a Watch Me Part Two with all the new dances and some older dances that's been out. And it's actually going viral right now. It's not on iTunes, it's not it's only on Vivo and it's only on Trilla. It's only on apps kids dance on. There's certain apps kids dance on that we don't use, and it's over at least 20 million kids that be on these apps and they be dancing. And that's where you're supposed to put your music in. That's where part two is now. Yes, that's where part two is on Trilla and Musical.ly. Yes, ma'am. I don't mean to make this a Sorrento show, but it is. Um, <laughs> what made you choose the production company that you were they the first ones there, or did you have a relationship, or did you like what they had done with other people? Well, everything 
you always get messed over first. It's like a person, they was messing me over when I was young, but they would introduce me to somebody to help me. Like, it's like you meet somebody, they helping you. They put you in front of the next person. It's like you just meet them for the next step. You just meet people for the next step. And I just, I just remember who I met, and I just never forget my relationships. So I utilize them. I'm like, I can't go through what I went through this time. Okay, he didn't even shoot my video, but he introduced me to this producer that's twenty dollars an hour, and I just, that's all I got is like a hundred. So that's enough for me to just try at least to do watch me because it only took me twenty minutes to do that. So I just learned from that. I just learned from my mistakes. That's my, learn from my mistakes and. When I met the video guy who didn't shoot our video when I was in the group, he introduced me to Bolo the producer. Bolo the producer had a good rate, and my family wasn't so interested in that, so I had to go to him. And he was already in the works with other big artists, and he got messed over. He had no control over those records, those big records, those hits. So when when he got one with me, it just was it was the point of this time he wasn't gonna lose. But since he helped me out, I decided I was like, you can have half of the song. Nobody didn't believe in me, and you just you you gave me the time I needed to do what I wanted to do. So you I just gave him half of the song, and the label came and he wanted seventy percent on my album which I didn't understand at the point because I wanted to work with other producers but I couldn't because of him. He was blocking other producers conflict of interest. So I had to get that terminated before I dropped my album because I want to work with other people. I just I'm, I want to work with other people. I mean once you make something big with somebody it's, I mean I want to make it with somebody else now. I just want to keep making great things happen. And when I felt like I was blocked from doing what I wanted to do, I cut it out. I mean, I know people was wanting music. I always tell my fans, it's, if it's not right, I'm not gonna do it. And it wasn't right, so I wasn't gonna do it. But in eight days, I'm dropping my first album. So everything is right. <laughs> Thanks to Vadia. Vadia. Um, are we out of time? We're out of time. But this is the last panel. Nobody's coming in. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have, we have time? Six minutes. We should preserve it now. I mean, honestly, it's, it's up to us. Six minutes. Yeah. How's your album coming out? My album's coming out with Vaya. And for the other parts, you gotta ask my manager. You know, I'm, I'm really, I'm trying to step out of the box of trying to be a manager, cause like I never had a manager. So my whole time of being an artist, I basically was a manager artist, consultant, just watching everything and in it and everything. I'm at a point now, I don't wanna do that. I just wanna be an artist. I just wanna show people what I can do and I wanna let Mr. World handle it and the rest of the staff that I hire. Yeah, I think that brings the whole thing like full circle. It's just like, you know, getting a team involved in your, you know, in your career that you trust, you know what I'm saying? So like the moment that you're, and we look at it also and just saying like the moment you're like like you're an artist and first and foremost like you should always be concentrating on like your art and creating your art it's important to get people a manager and a lawyer and and, and your core team around you that you trust that you can uh you know say okay you, you're handling my business aspect of it so i don't need to think about that i mean you should always look over you know at, at, at a high level but at the end of the day like you know nothing uh is built without help from other people my company uh, any, any, you know, I've never seen anyone do something truly on their own. It, you know, it involves other people that you trust, and it's a lot easier. And I'm sure you, you probably agree. It's a lot easier to get people in that you trust before things are popular, because once something goes crazy and there's a lot of money involved, people want to, you know, they want to get involved one way or another. They want to be your lawyer, or your manager, or your label, or whoever, and you don't know whether they like you for you or if they like you because there's a whole lot of money involved. And when money goes away, then the people go away, and then you, and then you need to find all, you know, yep. you need to regroup and find the people. Because then actually, you know, when when when, you, when you're coming off that hit, you know, because everyone, everyone can only see, you know, the one hit. And there's people saying, hey, like, there's, I mean, I, I know when I met, you know, when you and I sat down, 
in Atlanta, I was just like, you know, there's there's more in this kid than than just a, one song, you know. And it's just like, um, and so I, I think that you know the people that I'm sure who have stuck around you through all the you know through through you know through uh, I guess not the downturn, but like you know, but in your in your the part two of your career, you know, they're the people that you know that, that are with you. They want to you know they want to see right by you. So I think uh, I think I think that's really at the end of the day the core thing is really to kind of find the core people that you know that kind of look after you. Some solid people. Well, last words, last words. Yeah, we're, we're 10 minutes over now. We'll right. pass. Cool. There's the rap sign. It's the red rap uh, sign. Yeah. Rap, rap with a W. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you.